Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Trenda, Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I'll be your student host today for the webinar. So before we begin, I would like to express my great thanks to the Hong Kong Life Sciences Society and Johns Hopkins University for organizing such a fruitful webinar. We are very pleased to have Professor Words with us today. So today, Professor Words will be sharing the ongoing actions taken by Johns Hopkins University in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and an overview of his research in cancer metastatic field. And after that, we will have an open Q&A session. So hello, Professor Wirth, it's really nice to meet you. So with more than 7 million cases in 188 countries and territories, the world has definitely suffered from a severe COVID-19 thyroid outbreak. Can you please share with us your insights into the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes. And um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this amazing opportunity that I have uh, today, an evening for you and morning this, for us uh, here on the East Coast in the U.S. Uh, to share some, some of the things we've learned uh, about COVID-19. Um, the uh, rather uh, um, concerted and coordinated effort Johns Hopkins has developed uh, to develop uh, new treatments, to develop new protections and uh, new abilities to learn about this uh, terrific pandemic. Um, I was looking at the numbers this morning about Hong Kong, though. Um, I'm not sure that you have a lot to learn from Johns Hopkins. Um, there's been officially at least just four deaths, even if it's 10 times that, uh, the number of deaths uh, from uh, the disease has been very limited in Hong Kong, uh, just a few hundred cases. Uh, <clears throat> let's remind ourselves we had uh, 2 million cases in the US and, and more than 110,000 uh, Americans have died of COVID-19. Um, nevertheless, um, it's, it's an international disease. It's a virus that doesn't care about uh, borders, doesn't care about politics, doesn't care about if rich or poor, it affects everybody. And even if you're a business person, it will affect you because you cannot do business, at least internationally. So um, with that in mind, um, uh, and uh, going back in time, it's, it's um, March, early March, and Johns Hopkins researchers have been tracking the uh, tidal wave <coughs> of cases coming out of Asia, moving to Europe, and then moving to the US. And um, it's March 13th, it's a Friday, uh, it had to be. Uh, and uh, on that Friday, our public health experts, we are uh, the largest and, and oldest and also um, most prestigious school of public health in the US. Um, and these experts are telling us it's time to close down the campus. It's time to really run down as quickly as you can. Mind you, we're looking elsewhere and no other American university that we know of had closed at this point. Um, however, our public health experts had been in communications with um, actually people in Hong Kong, people in China, who were telling us, if you feel prepared, you are not prepared you're gonna to have to over prepare for this terrible disease. And uh, this collaboration really helped Johns Hopkins Hospital, Johns Hopkins researchers to truly get ready for an unprecedented tidal wave of cases and, and, and maybe chaos. And so uh, we closed down from March 13, that's a Friday, on Monday for a, a Wednesday closing. Again, no other peers had done this. Now, closing a university at Johns Hopkins may look like a small affair. Um, there's 5,000 faculty at Johns Hopkins University. So it's equivalent to really closing 5,000 businesses. Each faculty is very independent of each other. We to coordinate and um, close down our clinical trials, close down human subject research, animal research, basic science, <clears throat> All of this happened in a coordinated way. Within a matter of days, uh, the president of the university, Ron Daniels, decided very few universities uh, would have the ability to combine um, public health experts, clinical experts, maybe engineers, physicists, chemists, in a coordinated way to already start developing solutions for this pandemic. And he created a fund of $6 million to, um, that I started managing to coordinate tens of projects to develop 
new understanding about this disease. Because one thing clear, for instance, that if a vaccine should be worked on, it could be one or two years away. Meanwhile, people would die without new treatment. So our researchers develop and are developing new treatment. I'm going to talk about this a little bit, but also new detection tools. How could you detect with much more accuracy at the virological level, that's a virological test, at the surgical level, that's an antibody test. Clearly, right now, the accuracy of this test is very limited. Even 100% accuracy could still be limited for public health experts and, 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 and um, authorities to make decisions, make decisions about reopening businesses. And so we've developed uh, what is now the only game in town, the only treatment that actually saved lives uh, so far, which is um, the um, convalescent serum approach. That is a 120-year-old uh, approach that has been now modernized to modern times, where we take serum from patients who have been infected and survived, hopefully, and re-administer this blood after screening for uh, viruses, bacteria, and of course, blood type, re-administer uh, to patients. Uh, patients who are, and that's a first clinical trial, already have bad symptoms. And a second clinical trial is actually prophylactic. We are trying to see if pre-administration of this uh, serum that contain antibodies that are protective, we think, could alleviate the potential for infection for our frontline healthcare workers. Fast forward, we now have these clinical trials spread over hundreds of uh, universities uh, and academic hospitals in the US and abroad, in France, in Spain, and Asia as well. So that started from Johns Hopkins. Again, so far, the only solution that actually moved the needle for patients. Several other treatments are being developed at Johns Hopkins and elsewhere that actually diminish the terrible symptoms that come along with um, this disease. I want to point out one other treatment to really illustrate a point. The other treatment uh, that is on clinical trial at Johns Hopkins was one developed by world famous um, oncologist Bert Vogelstein. Look him up is the most cited scientist, scientist in the world. Um, he happens to have two very clever sons who together, that's the three of them, uh, decided to look into the literature and in using machine learning and AI, try to see if they could identify existing treatments, maybe used for other purposes, to repurpose these drugs for uh, tackling what's called the cytokine storm, this tidal wave of small molecules that are secreted by macrophages during what looks like a hyperinflation, inflammation response of your body to a, an infection. They now identify alpha blockers, which had been tested for antibacterial treatment and repurposed here for an anti uh, COVID-19 disease treatment. They're not sure it's going to save lives as much as it's going to diminish the terrible uh, side effects uh, and uh, symptoms that sometimes come along with COVID-19. So that's a second effort being developed at Johns Hopkins University. A third one I want to point to is a, an effort developed by a microbiologist. Again, uh, the point I want to make, by the way, about Bert Vogelstein is that he's a cancer researcher. Many researchers repurpose their expertise, their laboratories, their staff in the laboratories to tackle, to address COVID-19 research. And so the third example is that of a microbiologist, also immunologist, who has now published a test kit that um, allow for um, a saliva-based detection of antibodies. So, of course, you're well aware that for measurement of viruses, the state of the art remains 
a deep nasal uh, swab, uh, that is painful. Uh, women will say it's not childbirth, but it's pretty damn painful. Or a blood test based to measurement of antibodies, none of which very practical, none of which can really be scaled up at the level of millions, tens of millions, billions of people. And so we're looking, all of us, many universities are looking for maybe saliva based sampling. We've now published a paper, that is not us, that, that's a group at Johns Hopkins, has developed a test that is saliva based and is 100% accurate to measure uh, a level of antibody. So you may remember um, a, a few weeks ago, there were still questions about um, if the presence of antibodies in the blood would actually provide protection to people who had actually been infected. And fair question. Normally, in most viral-based diseases, uh, the generation production of, of antibodies can be protective. Um, but a um, study out of South Korea was putting doubt around this. Long story short, that's been corrected. And now clearly people who have been infected have a much lesser chance, if not zero chance, to be reinfected. The level of protection is still being assessed and the duration of protection is still being assessed. These are ongoing studies also at Johns Hopkins universities. But that test, saliva-based, is now being uh, tried in tens of sites and scaled up at the level of thousands of people as opposed to a few hundred people, which was the first pilot. So multi-pronged, multifaceted approach. I talked about treatment, almost old-fashioned treatment, but modernized. Um, and it's been incredibly effective. Um, and uh, the clinical trials now results are coming out and all very positive out of China already, out of Mount Sinai and out of Johns Hopkins. Two a, a new treatments, a little bit more modern um, because it's an actual drug um, that can alleviate some of the symptoms of COVID-19 and three, a test. On the basic science side of things, we, all of us, are trying to understand why the course of the disease is so heterogeneous. Why many different people with the same comorbidity uh, factors, indeed being a man, indeed being older, in being, having maybe being obese, can still lead to very divergent, very different courses of disease. We have epidemiologists, we have epigeneticists, and we have geneticists trying to understand the host response, right? Not only uh, the sequence of the virus may matter, but the actual genetics and epigenetics of the host of the persons may matter. And um, obesity um, is a common factor that we at Johns Hopkins have now identified um, as being one of the most important comorbidity factors in um, bad outcomes when infected. A lot more has to happen. Um, Mid-term, it's new treatments. Long-term, it's actual vaccines. Um, in the vaccines world, our um, immunologists are uh, not only developing um, actual vaccination uh, strategies, or a convalescent serum approach is informing the design of these vaccinations. We are learning of what antibodies actually provide the best protections, and that is informing the design of these drugs. Well, thank you so much for, for your detailed explanations about the actions taken by the so, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, yeah. Also, besides your efforts in COVID-19, as you know, as everyone knows that you are a pioneer in establishing the 3D migration model in cancer cells, and also your research in cancer metastasis. So would you like to spend another five to 10 minutes to tell us more about the research and a future chance for cancer metastasis, Bill? Thank you so much. So um, uh, in the middle of this crisis, a lot of us are now at home. This is my library at home. I'm a lucky guy. I have a beautiful library. Um, um, but um, it gives you um, an, an, an opportunity. You didn't ask for that opportunity, but it gives you an opportunity nevertheless um, to think longer and harder. We are always, um, uh, as researchers in normal times, you know, day to day, week to week, um, uh, and there has to be a silver lining to this crisis. One of them was that I got a chance to really 
look back at what I had done, but also prepare for the future. And so I'm going to share a couple of vignettes of research that really stemmed out of this uh, COVID-19 research. The first one is really grounded what I've done quite a bit in, in the last two or three years, but the second is very new. Uh, by the way, most of what I'm going to show you is unpublished. I figured you had read my papers. I'm kidding. You had not. Um, so um, I um, have, for the last few years, tried to really um, put the focus on, uh, in the context of cancer, on metastasis. So if you look at FDA-approved drugs in uh, cancer, not a single uh, drug has been approved to target what actually kills most cancer patients, and that is metastasis. Metastasis is the spread of tumor cells from a primary tumor, like the breast, say, to distant sites, say, the bone, the lung, the liver. Now, fundamentally, why metastasis is so much more lethal than a primary tumor site can be understood, understood the following way. If tumor grow at a distinct site and doesn't spread and remains contained, over time, when you have maybe some symptoms, a surgeon or detection, thanks to um, mammography for the case of breast cancer, a surgeon could come and maybe additional treatment could remove this tumor and we would be done. If that was the story of cancer, there would be no cancer research going on. We would be all done and we move on to the next disease. What actually, unfortunately, kills people is the spread of this disease to distant organs. Okay? Much less is understood about this mechanism by which cells, all of a sudden, we are confined within this primary tumor site and start spreading. First, through a stromal matrix, which is full of collagen, then into blood vessels or lymphatics to be on their way from this primary tumor site to distant site. This multi-step process we're trying to understand and then armed with this understanding, trying to develop treatment. And so the first vignette I like to develop is really um, a, a, a very general one that has led to an actual creation of a company. Okay? It is the following. It's a simple observation of someone who actually was never trained as a cancer cell biologist, and that's myself. At the first, at the primary tumor site, you see cells as they are being contained by the base membrane proliferating and proliferating. It's more and more cells in this finite volume. Physicists understand density, density because that's how you understand magnetism. That's how you understand phase transitions. Past a certain threshold density, that is a number of cells per unit volume, we discovered that cancer cells are starting to feel each other's presence. It's like quorum sensing for bacteria. They can, even at a distance, feel there's too many of us. It's time to get out of Dodge. It's time to get out of this confining space and start expressing molecule that will set you in motion out of this primary state. It's exactly what we observe. Let me show you little movies and you show immediately what we're talking about. Here's a breast cancer cells moving happily inside a collagen matrix. I said moving, but actually if you really look carefully, that cell is not going anywhere. It's confined, not going anywhere. It moves, but comes back to the same spot. That same cell, divide it and divide it over time. And some two or three days later, here's what we observe. Those cells that were not going anywhere have divided now and actually having net displacement. We went from a proliferative phenotype to a migratory phenotype. Same collagen matrix, same cancer cells. The cells have undergone a phase transition from one phenotype to the other, from proliferative and contained to non-proliferative and migratory. If we could, and we did, understand this phenomenon, block this switch 
which is really a central question of cancer. How we go, cells go from this primary tumor site to distant site, they have to switch from being merely proliferative to being migratory. Long story short, we discovered that cancer cells start producing, even when not touching each other, two molecules, two cytokines called interleukin-6 and interleukin-8. They've become quite famous because they're part of the cytokine storm I was talking about earlier in COVID-19. Never mind about that. We said, can we, and that's, uh, we use microchips to detect at the single cell level what molecules could really be responsible for this messaging, this uh, recognition, this sensing at a distance. Whole cells could really say, hey, I can see you at a distance. There's too many of us. Let's change our ability to migrate. We found that IL-6 and IL-8 both become overexpressed. So we did knockdowns, we did all kinds of controls. Long story short, IL-6 IL-8 are necessary and sufficient to produce this switch in phenotype. So that's the good news. We repurposed existing drugs against IL-6 and against IL-8, demonstrated in mouse models that indeed we could block this metastatic process. All right, long story short, the company is making these drugs that we don't want to work together. That happens all the time. They think they're going to cannibalize their own market and say, maybe there's a silver lining. And I'm at Johns Hopkins after all, and I can look around and really found amazing people, including Jamie Spangler, a colleague of mine who is a protein engineer, and in a matter of two weeks developed the antibody that you're looking at here. This is a bispecific antibody that can now, at the same time, instead of two separate molecules, sit on cancer cells and block this in IL-6 and IL-8 signaling pathway. This same pathway triggered the cells to uh, move. In, unlike these separate molecules, it allows for enhanced affinity and ability to tightly bind to the receptors on cancer cells. It is very specific because only we discovered cancer cells co-express IL-6 and IL-8 receptors, unlike immune cells, which also, but never at the same time, uh, express the same receptors. Avoid drug resistance because you block at the same time two pathways. It was, remember, the story in HIV AIDS where what saved the day in HIV AIDS was a cocktail of treatment which at the same time block all routes for uh, duplication virus. Same story here, at least philosophically, where at the same time we block two pathways and it's a single drug therapy. We don't need to explore a very complex um, a double dose of total dose plus fraction of one drug versus another. It's a single drug, you can do a dose treatment. And what I'm gonna show you here on the right is that it does what it's supposed to and completely block, at least in mouse models, of course, you have to start there, the ability of cells which uh, grew in the breast of these animals to metastasize to the lung, by the way, to the liver and the brain. By the way, the concentration we're using here are ridiculously low. For the two drugs I used to use, we used to use something like 50 milligrams per keg. For those who do mouse modeling, they know what I'm saying. It's the usual high dose you need to use to see any effect. We found that a minuscule value of 0.1 milligram per, per, per keg, we could use completely abrogate these ability of cells to metastasize. All okay, right, that's our first vignette. The second vignette is the one that came out of COVID-19. And um, it's a realization that pathology has been, uh, in a way, a field by which we can assess, diagnose disease that's been re really not evolving much in the last 50 years. Most of pathological assessment in cancer comes from a single section. You take a tumor, you resect it, you take it, you use what's called eosine and hematoxylin to around 50 year old dies to stain these tissues and pathologists hovering over a low tech microscope will make a, uh, an assessment of grade of uh, type of tumor to inform treatment. Well, we decided to move in 3D and this is what happened. On the left, we serially cut a tumor centimeter scale. 
When you do this, you're gonna squeeze each tissue. So we had to come up first, a technological solution to register these things. We reassemble these sections into a 3D tumor. That's what you see. Then use machine learning to automatically identify tens of tissue. I'm showing you fat cells, connective tissue, asinized. And because I wanna show off a little bit, we're gonna melt away the fat, melt away the islets, and focus from a centimeter scale to the millimeter, millimeter scale of what's called panin section. This is a pancreas um, tissue. And we, so no, this is millimeter by millimeter. We went a thousand fold uh, decrease in lung scale. We redecorating a fat. You can see you now basic concept of morphology of connectivity are really 3D concepts. They use routinely as a way to assess uh, tumor grade in 2D, but it's erroneous. All those concepts are really 3D. And now, all along, we have single cell resolution. We can track the position and the identity of billions of cells in whole tumors. This is a first, what you're looking at is the first ever full map, 3D map of a whole tissue. In this case, it's actually healthy, uh, well, also healthy uh, pancreatic uh, a tissue that was harvested from a patient um, and at single cell resolution. We go from the multiple centimeter scale, millimeter, 100 micron to a, a, a micron scale. So we can, thanks to this, upgrade uh, our ability to, uh, uh, for instance, our cells level of infiltration of immune cells in tumors in 3D. So think about this, right? Typically a pathologist will look at a single section and make assessments of in deciding for onco uh, immunological treatments if there's many immune cells that have penetrated your tumor. Well, that's done with a single section. We've discovered as you go inside these tumors, the level of penetration of immune cells into these tumors can vary from position to position within these tumors. Giving you pause because every day, standard of care, instead of assessment, um, pathology will use a, one or two such sections. Um, it's an expensive uh, uh, assessment. Right now, what you're looking at will cost between thirty and $40,000, but with high throughputness, hopefully, will improve uh, the cost and also uh, uh, improve our ability to move to different tissues. I'd like to move to the eye. I'd like to move to the skin, to the brain, um, and systematically re-evaluate, re-examine how tissues we think we understand, even in healthy people, the 3D organization. I'm gonna stop here. I, I hope you've learned a little bit about what I do in my lab and think about, and also of COVID-19 uh, response in this crisis. Yeah, okay, thank you so much, Professor Wirtz, for the excellent sharing on the actions from Johns Hopkins University in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and also his research on cancer metastasis. It's fabulous. Uh, now we'll move on to Q&A session. So maybe I'll start first. I'll start with a question about the COVID-19 response. So as everyone knows that Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Research Center has actually become one of the most popular websites to obtain the most up-to-date COVID-19 information with more than 1.2 billion interactions daily. It is also known that the website involves various departments, including the computer science departments and Johns Hopkins University to provide the most wide ranging and accurate information on the COVID-19 epidemiology. So I wonder what is the rationale behind setting up this resource center and also what impacts have the resource center created so far? Thank you. Oh, uh, James, thank you. Yeah. This is a great question. I didn't mention it in my presentation <laughs> because I felt I didn't have to. Um, but there's a great story behind this. And the rationale came from curiosity. At the end, research is all about curiosity. A Chinese student, and that matters, um, in the group of Lauren Garner, who's the professor behind this famous dashboard, was seeing in her country this increase in cases of a mysterious new virus, COVID-19, well, SARS, uh, and thought maybe she could track it and talked about it with her advisor, Lauren Garner, and decided because the 
um, interestingly, civil engineers who happen to do uh, uh, public health work, that's the story of modern research where affiliations don't matter less and less, develop this website. And like in business, when you're the first to come, um, you often have a competitive advantage over your competition. So that website that maybe you all use receive 4 billion views a day. That's more than CNN, uh, Fox News, you know, New York Times, or, or the Washington Post. And um, has uh, been a resource for many um, uh, newspapers, uh, many magazines who've used that data as a way to repurpose uh, that data in terms of, um, of course, presentation of the data. It's also have informed uh, policymakers. Um, and, uh, and sometimes with controversy. It, it can become political if a country doesn't like to hear that there's an increased number of cases or re-increased number of cases if business is reopening. Well, the data is the data. And, uh, and her um, dashboard have informed policymakers at the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, in all countries within the US, at the state level, at the city level, again and again, in town halls, in the governor mentions, people look at this data as a way to inform their own um, ability or non-ability to reopen business, for instance, or to see if hospital occupations is starting to reach uh, a saturation. Um, incredible impact. I'd venture to say no engineer in the last 20 or 30 years have had more impact in so little time. Um, more and more, when you see headlines of newspapers, um, it says Johns Hopkins of the Johns Hopkins dashboard fame, which is kind of cute. Lauren Garner maybe could add her name to the Johns Hopkins name. She's, she's had that much of an impact. So, so thank you for this. Um, she's a young faculty. She's a assistant professor with a small group. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, I've been pressing university for a accelerated promotion, which is, of course is in the works, uh, but uh, an amazing story. Uh, she's been featured, of course, in many newspapers, most recently in Il Monde, which is the French, the most famous French newspaper. Uh, she's a celebrity at this point, but she sticks uh, to the research and shares widely her data. If you're on GitHub, you can have access to the data, you can have access to the code. She's hiding nothing. So thank you, James, for this question. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your sharing as well. And oh, as you actually just mentioned that Johns Hopkins has a lot of research on the COVID-19 as well. And I've actually also read through a news that Johns Hopkins University has launched a COVID-19 research response program, which is yeah. actually an ambitious wide-ranging uh, wide research effort to tackle the many challenges pre presented by COVID-19. So I wonder if you can actually share more about the progress of this research as yeah. you did mention some of it, and yeah. I do want to know That's more right. about it. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, uh, so again, a little bit of history there, uh, because three months ago feels like 10 years ago. Uh, I know if you guys have the same problem, is that you lose track of time in this COVID-19. You don't know if you said something yesterday or, or two months ago. At least I have that problem. Uh, I'll blame it on COVID-19 and not uh, old age. But, okay, so the story here is that, as I mentioned, um, within a week, Ron Daniels had this vision that a uh, few universities, really there's a handful that would have their whole portfolio of expertise that could be um, really brought to front to really tackle this terrible disease. Um, set up that fund, $6 million, and, and it was my duty to now oversee this program. We had a call for proposals where um, uh, tens of groups um, uh, proposed ideas, very quick, uh, a review or rejection, and then approval after some iteration. And within a matter of days, we have funding uh, some 30 uh, different projects. It's 400 people now on campus. Mind you, the rest of the university is only opening, at least the laboratory research, this coming Monday. Um, but on campus, we only have COVID-19 researchers. All of them were funded internally um, and have tackled uh, questions of new therapies, as I said, new detection, understanding uh, the genetics of the virus. For instance, uh, let me add another pearl. Uh, it was a Johns Hopkins group at the Applied Physics Labs 
that discovered that the strain of virus that infected people on the East Coast in Europe, sorry, in, in the US, came from Europe, not from Wuhan. Of course, it originally came from Wuhan, but moved to Europe and from Europe moved to the US. And the strain was not straight from China, but actually through Europe. By genetic sequencing, you can map almost in, in time and space which strain affect which population. And so, of course, blocking travel from China um, and was, didn't change anything because it's travel from Europe that actually uh, should have uh, been blocked. But story for another day. Um, so um, very concerted effort. We are publishing immediately everything. We're not sitting on data. We have the principle that this data is so important and that it has to be shared widely immediately. So we use preprints, bioarchive, meta-archive, as a way to share immediately our new results or, or, or new data to be not analyzed by anyone who wants to. So um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's been a wild ride, but I've seen uh, something special, which is that people rolling their sleeves and getting it done. I have another little story. Uh, at the beginning, another very famous cancer researcher, Liz Jaffe. She was the president of the American Association for Cancer Research. Uh, she's world famous for her work on uh, vaccines in uh, cancer, um, especially pancreatic cancer. Liz Jaffe uh, dropped everything and set up in her own lab a testing uh, platform for uh, COVID-19. She didn't have to do this, but she felt it was her duty to uh, set aside her current interest in cancer and really at the beginning of the pandemic, add to the, the pathological, you know, clinical pathological department's ability to test. And so Johns Hopkins, in a matter of days, was able to test thousands of people a day. Uh, and it, it takes initiative. It takes, of course, know-how. I mean, Liz Jaffe is an amazing scientist. But also just a, a, a sense that, you know, it had to be done. And she was not giving order, given orders by anybody. She didn't have to do this, but did it anyway. So a, a lot of amazing story in this terrible uh, pandemic has come out at Hopkins and elsewhere, for sure. Thank you so much for your question, Abdul. So here is a question from one of our participants. So uh, she's actually mentioning that you also mentioned during the presentation that there is the closure of the campus to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And she noticed that there is a work group in Johns Hopkins University, which is actually currently, currently examining the impact of the lab management and safety strategies. And also she mentioned uh, Johns Hopkins University has developed a street-based reopening plan. So indeed, a lot of other universities have referenced and are considering to follow the protocol. So uh, when would you expect the university to be reopened? and what actions will be implemented in each stage to protect the students from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank yeah. you, James. Uh, so uh, while it took us three days to run down operations, uh, unbelievable task, actually a random uh, plant, which we posted immediately on the website, were emulated by many American and non-American universities. Literally, your plans were copied and pasted at Penn State, Northwestern, and other universities. Shoot, don't tell anybody. We let them do that because we felt we had the capacity to develop quickly plans that were quite elaborate. We thought that was complex. We thought that was difficult. We had seen nothing yet. Um, to run back up operations, it turned out to be much more difficult. You know, it has taken us weeks to develop a plan at the university level, including this phasing system, at the department, school level, department level, and individual laboratory level. And so the first realization was that we couldn't open labs again unless the state of Maryland, where we are, and the city of Baltimore, where we are, would give us the green light. So first we had to realize we couldn't open on our own without the permission. So that happened, we worked on that. Second principle is that there was no way I or anybody in leadership could design a plan that would cover all the 
heterogeneities, all the details of every single lab at the university. Remember I said we have 5,000 faculty. We have, you know, 2,000 labs at Johns Hopkins. So we figured we should ask the principal investigators, each faculty, to come up with their own plan for their own laboratory and with uh, some templates, customize those plans for their own operation. Okay? They would be able to know where the chemicals are, how to clean the benches better than an administrator like me. Okay? So that was the second principle. The third one is that we couldn't just have plans for every single lab. No, we had to have plans for that a floor, for instance, we have different labs, could coordinate. You don't want every morning, everyone comes at the same time and leave at the same time. So now we have to coordinate at the floor level, at the building level. To do that, we've developed applications. We develop cell-based apps to monitor in real time density in the laboratories, density in the buildings. And our opening date is this coming Monday. We're all very happy to be able to come back to lab. We are going bunkers, staying at home, and we're all very eager to go back. Yet, we're going to have to do it in a safe and coordinated way. We think we have it. We're doing a little pilot as we speak today and tomorrow, where an institute, among many other institutes, a single institute, is going to kind of test out our policy, test out their plans, see if it works, feedback on Thursday morning, and if it works, we should be able to indeed give the full green light to all laboratories on Monday. So stay tuned. Um, and um, we kind of have it perfect, but we think we have it close to, 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 to perfect. And we've very widely shared our plans again for this phasing. The, the thing that's going to take a little bit longer is clinical trials. So we do a lot of work you know, at the bench, of course, that's laboratory research, and that's very low risk. We do also, of course, as you know, a lot of clinical trials, and I mentioned one earlier in, in this biospecific. Well, that's more complex. That involves patients, that involves the larger public. It's high risk. And so it's going to take us a little bit longer, not only to come up with a plan, although we have that, which is being reviewed, but also to really run back up. So only right now clinical trials that have a direct benefit to patients are really going to be allowed back on campus. Um, clinical operations have been dramatically reduced. We only also now ramping back up clinical activities. All non-essential procedures, all so-called um, uh, 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 elective surgeries, for instance, have been postponed. We are clinic by clinic, with the permission of uh, the city for every clinic opening, reopening the hospital for non-COVID uh, clinical work, and then accordingly clinical trials and human subject research involving clinical work uh, as well. So elaborate, many moving parts. I'm in charge of all of this, but I've had uh, you know, uh, the, the luxury to have a lot of um, very brainy people to tap into to really make me think of all the ins and outs of how we could do this uh, very uh, carefully. Great question. Okay. All right, thank you so much for your question as well and also answering. Here's another question from one of your participants. So uh, we do look forward to the reopening of the labs and campus and it's also well noted that you are a pioneer in establishing uh, the 3D migration models and additionally you did mention a lot about the current breakthroughs in the cancer metastasis field and also about the 3D model. Um, so he's wondering what are the impacts that your research have for, for the patients clinically and what are some new directions in the future chance of the cancer metastasis research? Thank you. This yeah. is a great question. So as I mentioned, it's striking to see how, you know, our century of research in cancer has led to what I could say almost an obsession about tumor growth. We should, of course, as cells proliferate, it's the mark of cancer, is uncontrolled proliferation. However, as I said, besides brain tumors and maybe some other type of cancer like ovarian cancer, most cancers, as I said, are initially confined before they spread to distant organs. 
and could be treated if you don't have metastasis with cytotoxic drugs and surgery. What kills patients metastasis and a lot less is understood about metastasis. So the future to me lies in really increasing our understanding of that process. How cells switch from being confined and proliferative to migration. Our work is just one piece of the puzzle. We're gonna need a lot more work about this. Um, and accordingly, a lot more treatment. I can tell you, we've created a company, okay? And we are trying to translate this by specific antibody for uh, treatment in pancreatic cancer and triple negative breast cancer. Why? Because they're very, they typically caught late, they're very lethal, and most people who are diagnosed with these two types of cancers have metastatic disease. Um, many investors are very shy about anti metastatics. And it's because they're not used to it, because imaging can detect big tumors and see these tumors melting away. Mind you, no real correlation between the ability of a tumor to melt away or disappear thanks to treatment and actual clinical outcomes. But that's what people understand. That's what people can um, really visualize. I always say, when a patient right, undergo a chemotherapy and it quote unquote works, the patient is happy, the family of the patient is happy, the oncologist is happy, the drug company is happy. So what's not to be happy about? The problem is that too often, that's not sufficient. That you may have undetectable METs at the distant side that cannot be imaged by MRI, PET scan, and other type of imaging modalities. We need to add to our current standard of care treatment the kind of drugs we are developing, like bispecific. It'd be the standard of care treatment, like gemcetabine, or, um, a, a Taxol, in addition to an anti-metastatic drug. And that, I think, is the future of cancer. All immunotreatment, by the way, target the primary tumor. It is no more and more clear that even what looked like cure is not cure. That people who have been treated with these immunotherapies over time develop resistance and again, the cancer uh, regrow. Therefore, once again, we need to combine immunotherapies with the kind of drug we've developed to prevent metastasis. Yet, I'm telling you, to convince funders, to convince investors is difficult. So it's a plea to uh, this uh, crowd in Hong Kong to maybe be a little bit more gutsy and more courageous than all American investors and maybe say, I see a future in uh, anti-metastatic drugs. Great question. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for your answer. So here is a question from Alex, uh, who, a student who is really interested in bioinformatics. Uh, she said that, I think this 3D tumor model is amazing, it, given that there are so many cancer patient data already available on large rapid, uh, rapid cities. Do you think that these 2D histological slides will be eventually obsolete, or is there a, any way that we can still use these database? And I, um, she also asked whether it's possible to map the new 3D data to the existing 2D data. Thank uh, you. What a great question. So we, we, we've done this, right? So uh, first, the last question and the, 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 the former question. The last question is that um, if you take random in this 3D tumor, right? You take random section and you, you do a grade and stage assessment. You take a pathologist that you, this is grade two, uh, this is, uh, you know, pancreatic cancer, this is the level of penetration of uh, immune cells. Um, and then you reshuffle these slides and you do it again. You may get a, diff you often get a different answer. And that gives you pause, of course, right? It means that many of our traditional assessment of tumors really are, are not very good. Um, and yet, you know, the, the standard at the Department of Pathology at Johns Hopkins and elsewhere. You go to Tombuctu, Hong Kong, Santiago de Chile, or Baltimore, and it's the same way people have been doing it. It's slight variations. So what does it take to move to 2D, 3D? 
it's going to take initially a lot of investment, funding agencies and maybe investors. The, the problem, I think, quickly is going to become cost. And therefore, the more we use it, the cost should go down. If you were to map me, say I die, and you map me, you sequence it, it would take $2 billion to map me at the single cell level. So that's too expensive. Um, so we're going to need uh, those costs to go down. Uh, it gets $20 per slide, right? You have a thousand slide, it's $20,000. That's too expensive. We're going to have to go down to more like $500 or less. Um, a lot more to be done, but the more there's interest, the more there are killer apps, the better and the more the interest of investors potentially and funding agencies. So you've seen something that is unfunded, unpublished. So don't tell your cousin, only if that cousin is very rich, then maybe yes, we can talk. Okay, thank you so much for your answer. So here will be the last question. Thank uh, you. So Aida would like to ask, what are your views on the electrochemical amino sensing of cancer protein biomarkers? Before they answer, metastasis. Yes. So we, uh, for the, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, not the 3D stuff, the, the interleukin stuff. We have seen no correlation between the level of expression of interleukin 6 and 8 and their receptors in tumors and actually the ability of our um, uh, antibody to work. So more, you know, to routinely in a standard way, it is believed there is a vague correlation the level of expression of protein and you know uh, the ability of a drug to work. Let me illustrate. In cancer cells, the level of expression of IL-8 receptor is very high. The level of expression of IL-6 receptor is very low. Yet, you need IL-6 to be blocked in order for this antibody to work. So this old-fashioned way to say, only do you have a biomarker, do you, does a drug work, um, need to be revisited. And uh, our investors and our funders ask about this all the time, but now that we've proved there's no correlation, we're going to need new biomarkers, maybe imaging biomarkers, but a specific biomarker um, uh, revealing level of expression receptors or interleukin-6 may not work. The molecule itself is in your blood. If you run around the block, you know, you go for a run, your level of interleukin-6 and 8 will increase in your blood. So that's a problem because it means that depending if you come in the clinic in the morning or the afternoon, your level may change. So a blood test based measurement is not going to work either. Um, so we're looking for a um, companion diagnostical tool that would help us triage patients who could more successfully uh, undergo a treatment with a biospecific compared to none. Um, we think though, a treatment is very general and essentially uh, uh, universal, that all cancer cells do this. We've seen it in prostate, pancreas, the breast, liver cancer. We think, I'm a physicist. I love universal laws of, of, of nature. And maybe we may have discovered an extremely general law of cancer uh, progression, that all cancer cells at some point when they congest it, start expressing these interleukins as a way to switch phenotype. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so since time is running short now, this will be the end of today's webinar. So once again, we sincerely appreciate Professor Wirtz for his strengths today, and thank you all for joining this webinar and giving us a lot of good questions and those answers. Before you leave, remember to like our Hong Kong Life Sciences Society Facebook page and follow us on Instagram. You stay tuned with us and our next webinar will be on the 24th of June, but we will have Dr. Cecilia Choi from Welcome Trust to share with us the challenges and opportunities for early life sciences career. Once again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Words and also Professor Words, as well as all the participants. Thank you so much for joining and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, James. You're a wonderful host and I hope you've enjoyed your, the, the talk and presentation. I'd like to also, of course, uh, thank John and, and Vicky for co-organizing this with you guys. I, I, I'm, I was so looking forward to do this in person in Hong Kong. Hopefully it's for another day. Uh, uh, hopefully we, we'll be able to do it uh, soon enough. Thanks yeah, so much. Hopefully for I can be a student host again. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.